amazing speech, as always. Okay, so um, clearly the theme tonight is what does it mean to be an abolitionist? As an artist, as an activist, what does it mean to be an abolitionist? Um, and I'm going to begin, actually, with, with uh, our other guests. As you know, there's Fred Moten, poet, artist, amazing scholar. And then Melanie Cervantes, an incredible artist, activist. Um, so I'm going to bring, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to give Angela a chance to take a breath, um, as I'm trying to take a breath. <laughs> Um, but let me just begin with um, talk a little bit about the role of art in movement. Um, clearly, we saw the LA Poverty Department do something extraordinary. This man here, this amazing, amazing uh, performance. And what they do is they, they create theater and creative work that really connects lived experiences to policy issues, to structural forces. They teach us lessons. They force us to think through um, all of our constrictions. Uh, and Fred, as a poet, and I say poet because you're a poet when you're not even writing poetry. You're, everything you say is poetry as far as I'm concerned. Um, but you've written eloquently about the aesthetics of the black radical tradition, developing a theory of the black voice, about the black cry, the black wail, um, embedded in wordless utterances. Uh, you know, your work's not agitprop. It's, it's about really pushing us to think beyond even words. And just for you, I want you to talk a little bit about um, you know, how your work, how you connect your work to the project of abolition. In other words, what are you thinking about abolition in relationship to your work? You know. Well, um, I think that the, well, the, the title for, for our gathering tonight is Abolition in the Radical Imagination. And um, for me, the, the idea of radical imagination kind of has two components. Um, we often think about imagination as this mode of thought that uh, helps us to see that which doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. But I think that imagination is equally important in helping us to see what does exist. And not only the bad things, not only the oppressive and horrible and brutal violent things that we have to contend with, but also the things that allow us somehow um, miraculously to survive those things. Um, and so for me, that means that poetry and art is always, you know, engaged in this really delicate balance between critique and analysis on the one hand and celebration on the other. I mean, this was, this was something that was apparent even in, in Angela's speech, that kind of amazing poetic break between the moment in which you mentioned your fellow defendant, Rochelle McGee, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what it means to be able to go from that moment of sadness and despair and ongoing loss, and then to say, but we're here to celebrate tonight. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So for me, the aesthetics of the black radical tradition is just this long, beautiful experiment in trying to figure out what it means to live that condition, that condition that combines loss and sadness and tragedy almost immediately with the necessity and the desire to celebrate. Right, right, right. You said, you said the word experiment. That's really critical. You know, I mean, we think of the avant-garde as experimental. And if you could just say a little bit more about you know, what does it mean to experiment for our history to be an experiment towards something else? Well, it, it's, again, it's kind of got a double edge to it, you know? Um, you know, because when you decide to go to another part of the world and load over the course of three or 400 years, 45 or 50 or 60 million people on a ship, mm. on ships, 
and take them to another place across thousands of miles of water, you could say that that's a really horrific, brutal, vicious, violent kind of an experiment that has been conducted on us and that's still being conducted on us. And the double edge of it, of course, is, is that to be, to have been swallowed, you know, literally incorporated into that experiment requires us to be experimental in our response to it. Right, um, absolutely. So somehow against the grain of all that brutality, we still have to work and figure out a way to live. Right. And we still have to work and figure out a way to love each other. And sometimes I think we still even have to figure out, as hard as it is, this might be the hardest thing, we got to figure out how to love the people who did this to us. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm still working on it too, but, 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 but the reason I raise it as a question and not, you know, as an imperative, in other words, I'm not sitting here trying to say that that this is a demand that anybody can make of us. Right. Yeah. Right. But it is an imperative that we have to take up for ourselves because I still haven't figured out a way to save the earth without saving them too. Yeah. Um, right. so. So, so Melanie, you make art. Um, beautiful art, amazing art, but you also made a choice to not make that art solo, to, to be an organizer, to be an activist, to work collectively. Um, why this choice? What, what does it mean for your work to be part of a movement rather than uh, doing solo projects, which we often associate artists with? Mm -hmm. I think as a younger person, my inability to navigate the pain of such oppressive systems and um, I think as a young person a difficult time being able to imagine something different, being able to imagine a future at all. I could really only imagine that evening. What am I doing tonight and we'll see if I'm around tomorrow. Um, that desperation was isolation. I felt very isolated and unable to have any agency to change the conditions around me. And as I began, began my journey um, in school, I began to find a language to be able to describe um, the experiences that I had and to come to understand them not as isolated experiences, but collective experiences. And it was through like campus-based organizing that I had a vehicle. And I didn't have any of that language back then. I was like, I just want to hang out with these people. They're really awesome. They know right from wrong. They know who to stand with. They know how to have each other's backs. And over time, I, I, I continued to gain language and understanding and, and analysis. and but. Fundamentally, the, the core of that was around like being with my people that, that had my back and whose back I had. And, and over the course of time, that evolved to really um, become an understanding of the value of organizing mm -hmm. as a place to build collective power. And, and in some or most instances, it's actually really a way to awaken the power that already exists in us. I think what really ends up happening and, and what's happened to me personally is like I, I couldn't recognize that I would, could be a powerful person. Mm -hmm. I felt completely disposable, unimportant. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't do anything that mattered, that, that I had no place in history. And you know, to now find a practice of making, which for me really is um, 
this process to help reflect what I see in the world. And I am so inspired by the organizers, when the people most impacted by the issues that we're talking about, when I hear young people that are being targeted by things like gang injunctions that are like uh, being catapulted into this system, talk about the solutions, talk about don't be afraid of me. That's what they want you to be afraid of me in this community, come out and be with us and get to know that we love our community just as everybody else does. Like those things enliven me and make me feel like something very different is possible and that it's here in that moment and it feels fleeting, but I want to capture it. And so I found this process and it's image making and right. it's really just a reflection of the beauty that I see in organizing and movement. Right. So like I feel like such a fortunate, audience mm -hmm. to the world right. of people that are changing things. Right. But you also empower communities. So one of the things that Dignidad of Abel does, um, according to the website, is you, as I just quoted, so you translate the stories of struggle and resist resistance into artwork that can be put back into the hands of communities who inspire it. Can you describe that process and what it does to those communities? Right. So I think, you know, we really embrace the idea of working collaboratively. So that means, at the very least, a couple of us are collaborating to create imagery. But often it means that we're um, collaborating with community-based organizations. And they vary from very like grassroots, scrappy organizations that are neighborhood-based, that have no like financial resources but a lot of heart to like you know bigger organizations that have infrastructure and that are really like trying to move big things um, but that that collaborative process is really about this um, exchange and I think it is that you know like I I sometimes feel like what we do is such a little thing. I feel like it's such a little thing but it's something that I have that I can hold on to and that I can give it back because it's a gift. Like, I feel like it's a gift that I'm here and almost 40, you know? It's a gift. It's a miracle, it feels like. So, like, to, to be able to, like, look out and see how people are organizing to change things, like, that means capturing the very people that are doing that organizing. Um, I believe we have a free postcard that I designed for this evening that'll be available to everyone here tonight. Um, it reflects the organizers from LAPD and critical resistance because it's very, for me, it's very important to reflect the real people, that it's not just like something made up, that there's real people, flesh and blood, that have had deep experiences and that have the solutions and that can lead us in that work to change um, the very society we live in. And so that means many things. It means like giving the graphics back and you know like there's been thousands and thousands of posters that we've given out um, all over. You know sometimes it's just like stacks of posters at a protest. It could be a postcard. You know we, we try to figure out the mechanisms to do that. It could be a PDF on a website. Um, but it also means like engaging with people to do skill shares and show them how to do the actual art process so that they feel as empowered by this these practices as we have. Mm -hmm. And that has been a tradition that has existed, especially I think for us in, in the Americas, it's like over 100 years old right. to have this intersection of politic and art making. So we're just, we're not, we didn't like invent the wheel. We're just continuing it on and holding that tradition close. Okay, thank you. So that's a perfect segue for my question for, for Angela. Um, yes, you didn't invent the wheel. Yes, there's a relationship between politics and art making. And Angela, um, I've always thought you were like 10 people because <laughs> there's only 10 people could produce all the things you produce. Uh, in so many different fields. And one of your great, great, great books, you've written the best book on the history of the blues and blues women and connected to an intellectual history of black feminism. Clearly the best book. Um, and people would be mad at me, but it's true. <laughs> so having said that, can you talk a little bit about the I can also talk about your book. Oh, yeah, book. don't talk about my book. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but can that you talk? That is really the best book. Oh, it's not, not the best book. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about the role that art plays 
in changing our perspective. You know, in other words, in what ways is art, culture, a material force in changing our conditions, uh, in changing the way we see the world? Um, you could talk about it in terms of contemporary situations. You could talk about it in terms of your work on the blues. Just, just to hear your thoughts about the role of art as a material force. You know. Well, first of all, um, we cannot exist without art. Yes. No. I, can, I can't imagine a world without art. Uh, and, you know, art is, it, it's, is always embedded in our efforts to create a better world, to achieve justice. Uh, it, is, it, it, it gives leadership to us. As Fred was, uh, was saying, that it um, both allows us to see what um, is not yet possible, but it also allows us to see those things that are right in front of our eyes and that we refuse to see. Yeah. Right. Uh, and it seems to me that, that all, one can always um, look at uh, where we may be going the possibilities of change by looking at what is happening in, in visual art and music. Uh, and I was uh, thinking, you know, everybody's been talking about uh, Beyonce's performance uh, up north uh, uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. But I watched the Grammys, uh, and when Kendrick Lamar <laughs> on network television can give us that kind of performance, that means that, that things are, if, not, if they're not changing, this is a conjuncture where new possibilities are emerging. Right, absolutely. And, and so, um, you know, it's always seemed to me to be the case that art is even more important than the political leaders uh, who give us the analysis. Uh, and years ago, years ago, I visited um, Grenada uh, during the era of the Grenadian Revolution. Uh, and I went to a rally expecting to hear Maurice Bishop, you know, go on for hours and hours. Uh, but the rally consisted primarily of music and poetry because it was that that uh, helped to create a sense of unity among the people. It was that that helped to um, uh, create this sense that, that, that the people of Grenada were moving in a revolutionary direction. Uh, so yeah, art is the most important dimension of change. Uh, right, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's pretty terrible when uh, organizers often assume that the art is the, quote, entertainment, right. uh, <laughs> or that is what the cultural um, uh, production provides us with a kind of relief. Uh, from our work of analyzing what is going on. Uh, and I think that's absolutely wrong. I think we would probably learn more if we figured out how to appreciate uh, the lessons that uh, come to us from the cultural production than you know, listening to uh, the words uh, uh, from people like me. Well, although I have to say that your, your words are a work of art as far as I'm concerned. Um, and in addition, what the, what the LA Poverty Department did today was a work of intellectual uh, engagement of the highest order, you know? So I think tonight is proof of everything you just said. Um, so in keeping my pattern of two questions per person, I have one other question. Um, and that uh, has to do with uh, what you mentioned to the, uh, in your talk, that this is the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Black Panther Party. Uh, and this is also, the week where um, Stanley Nelson's film, Vanguard of the Revolution, is being aired on PBS. We had an event at UCLA last night about it. Um, and it's so funny, because 
everyone comes up to me as, as if somehow like I'm your agent and they'll say, how come Angela's not in that film? You know, that's the first thing they say, um, which is really interesting. If you haven't seen the film, you should see it. But that's not my question. Um, my question just has to do with, um, with the party as a kind of precedent, a, you know, for whatever limitations and problems and contradictions, um, it was a movement that had at its core an abolitionist politics um, or vision, still in formation. It, it focused on self-determined uh, resources, resources from the people for the people. Um, and, you know, and I'm wondering, um, it's also a, a movement that attempted to address community needs democratically. You know. um, what are your thoughts about not just the party, but just the history of actually enacting abolition democracy through social movements? Um, are there precedents? Are there models that we could look for? Are there um, lessons that we can learn from history about how to begin that without always you know, expecting the state to do it for us, you know, but movements that are actually trying to, to build an abolition vis vision? Yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. um, and you, more than anyone else, know that history. I should be asking you that question, Robin. Uh, uh, because hey, look, you, I'm the moderator. So I'm the <laughs> <laughs> because I, I you've it. done all of this amazing um, historical research on, 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 on movements, on social movements, uh, labor movements, black movements. Uh, and I think, that, I think that history is so important because we almost always act as if we are the ones who are starting mm -hmm. the whole process. And, we, and, and perhaps it's because of the extent to which you know, capitalism has affected the way we think of, about ourselves. Uh, yes. And you know, neoliberalism, yeah. we are always urged to think of ourselves as individuals. And, you know, not as a part of a community, as, as, as Melanie was so eloquently um, speaking about, and a community that extends back in time, and a community that is going to extend forward in time long after we're gone from this earth. So. And, but I know your question was about uh, programs like uh, the uh, a free breakfast program and and and, and um, the free clinic and 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 the schools, yeah. I mean, I mean it's 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 amazing that now uh, there are breakfast programs in many schools across the country. That's right. Mm -hmm. But nobody acknowledges that it was the Black Panther Party which originated the idea that children cannot learn as long as they are hungry. And you know what I what what I remember uh, saying a few years ago when we were celebrating you know all of these uh, anniversaries the fifth fiftieth anniversary of uh, the March on Washington the fiftieth anniversary of the Birmingham campaign all of the fiftieth anniversary of the sit-ins uh, you know all of the civil rights anniversaries um, and of course. Uh, those have become a part of the narrative, the official narrative of this country because they are represented as helping this world, this country to become a more democratic place. Uh, uh, and that's not what those struggles, they, they weren't. Right. They were about more democracy, but they weren't about accepting the version of democracy that the US has offered us. Uh, and certainly, the Black Panther Party was totally upfront about it. It was totally non-assimilationalist. So. And you know, I've said many times, if you look at those 10 points on that 10-point program, uh, you understand why um, uh, Obama is not calling for a s observance of the 50th anniversary of the Black Panther Party <laughs> as he did for you know, all of the other anniversaries. Right. Right. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Um, we, we have... <laughs> you should be. 
Yeah, he should be. He That's should true. be. <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm sure that at some point he had some free breakfast someplace. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, but be that as it may. Um, so.